I totally agree. We have to break it. I, I don't dislike the idea of a filibuster, but the way that it's been abused by Democrats for so long and, and the way that the government has been abused by Democrats, it seems to me a, an, a natural step, and it's surprising that McConnell won't do it. Well, they like their prerogative, and they worry uh, about being in the minority again. And that's what looms over mm -hmm. their heads. No senator wants to give up a filibuster. Uh, but the problem is it, the Constitution uh, allows the Senate to uh, create its own rules. True. But the filibuster is not constitutionally uh, required, mandated. Yeah, I don't remember that provision of the Constitution, right? Precisely. Uh, now, it's also said, and people will say in, in praise of the filibuster or in justification, well, you know, the Senate is supposed to be a great deliberative body, to which I respond, absolutely. And guess what? Over the most of the 20th century and into the 21st, we have asked the federal government to do vastly more mm -hmm. than its original portfolio. So that we were never meant by the framers to be waiting on the Senate to reach consensus about matters that have to do with how citizens conduct their lives, namely pensions and benefits in particular, housing, and education. Since the, since the 17th Amendment, since the popular election of senators, it appears well, that the deliberation of that body has, uh, or the de deliberative nature of it has been dramatically weakened. Well, it's, it's, we have, and we've expanded the, you know, the, my biggest concern as it was for many uh, in the last election uh, was the composition of the Supreme Court. Uh, and Justice Scalia's death was a blow. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a punch to the gut. So uh, that also, of course, emphasizes to all of us uh, what can happen uh, when our side is in the minority. Uh, and we like to have that uh, filibuster power, uh, if you will, to uh, you know forestall events that we would find uh, troubling, like the elevation of a Supreme Court justice whose uh, opinion, particularly on the Commerce Clause, uh, was different from Justice Scalia's, as would have been the case uh, had McConnell not use mm -hmm. the filibuster, right, to and, uh, to block the nomination. But he had to break the filibuster to elevate Justice Gorsuch. And at this point, this is this is like football uh, in two ways. Number one, Chuck Schumer's like Lucy. He, he you know, he issues yeah. the sanctimonious twaddle about how, of course, now we have to compromise the intones and, mm -hmm. oh, you know, oh, yes, he's so then serious. He lifts up that uh, ball. But he has no intention, right? He's going to keep moving that football. Uh, and Mitch McConnell's Charlie Brown. But the other way it's like football is that we have to say at this point, you know what, we've got to play this quarter. Because we may yeah. not have a game after this. And if they don't break the filibuster on cloture on legislation, they're never going to reach a package that will have enough uh, fiscally conservative reforms that we really do need. And I'm a partisan in that way. Damn it, we need Republicans to pass this thing. I don't mm -hmm. want to exclude Democrats, but I don't want them to obstruct. We're never going to get there unless they break the filibuster on legislation. And to and mix just, metaphors as much as we possibly can, you bring up a point that I really admire you for. I really admire the way you've conducted yourself from the last, from this last presidential election onward, which is that you have to play the hand you're dealt. You have to play the cards in front of you. Politics is not about imagining how lovely it would be if something else had happened or if we lived in a different universe where Donald Trump were polite and nice and behaved himself at cocktail parties or that some that Jim Gilmore were the nominee of the Republican Party. You have dealt or in Mitch reality. Daniels. Or Mitch, or Mitch Daniels. I mean, you and I, you turned me on to Mitch Daniels. We spent a long time trying to get that guy to run. But, know. you know, I, I've spent long enough imagining what it would be like to have that guy run for office. And you supported Donald Trump. You, I did. perhaps the most intelligent and educated member of your class in Congress and possibly in D.C., period. You know, I, I really admire this because you come from circles that would be considered educated, elite, intelligent, uh, socially refined, and you put your political goals and the political good of the country before your own uh, image and your own sense of associating with a man who many consider uncouth. Well, and, and I know, Michael, we've talked about it, but uh, President Trump uh, represented to me uh, by far the better alternative for all of us. And he is uh, someone who uh, has uh, acknowledged 
uh, the advice and counsel of people like Larry Kudlow and mm -hmm. Steve Moore and Art Laffer and David Malpass, all of whom uh, have the best ideas on how to move us forward in terms of fiscal policy. Uh, I know they're not the only voices the president has heard, but but we I know this uh, quite firmly. Hillary Clinton uh, would have given them no credence. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it, if it's a matter of aesthetics, uh, the president is blunt. Uh, he's forthright, uh, and he sometimes uh, says things that uh, others might, with justification, find objectionable for one uh, objectionable for one or another reason. Uh, but we don't elect a president based on aesthetics. Mm -hmm. We base it and look at how he has performed with FEMA, with all the people whom he and his administration put into place to manage these two back-to-back -back enormous natural disasters and he's got nothing but praise for it. Mm -hmm. When he's gone overseas and he's talked with our allies, they have welcomed him. This is a man who understands far more than he's given credit for. Uh, and you know, Michael, I, am, I have run out of patience uh, with, and you and I both know the elites of which we speak. You're exactly right, the, uh, the Ivy League elites in particular. Uh, and I'm on the Princeton University Politics Department Advisory Council. I think Yale is going to rescind my diploma. I don't. I don't yeah, know I how I stand with them anymore. But it, it's nice that you've that you. They haven't totally kicked you out of the, the no, well, association. Yeah, since last October, but we did have a raft of work that we did, and then it was uh, kind of done for a while. But uh, but you know what? And I enjoy it. And I appreciate it. And I think you know there's some terrific people working there, uh, including our chairman. But. Uh, at our meeting in October before in 16, before the election, uh, we had a discussion after formal business was concluded about for whom we would vote for president. Uh, and again, I'm not the only Republican on this committee, but I was certainly the only one who said, well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. You, you were the only one. You were the only, okay. even among oh. Republicans. Michael, far and away. I mean, mm -hmm. I was assailed. Well, Michael, as you know, uh, those whom we uh, brush, as, if you will, uh, you know, who, to whom we give the designation establishment Republicans, uh, have at least as much disdain uh, or had at least as, as much disdain for the prospective Trump voter as did Democrats. Absolutely right. That's absolutely right.